Do you youngsters ever ask you, what did you do before television was invented? Now, sometimes it's hard to answer that question in a way that they'll understand. Of course, we, we read. And we played out in the fresh air a lot more. At least that's what we tell the kids. But maybe there's another answer. Ask them to come in now and listen to these wonderful bits of imaginative trivia. Have you tried Wheaties? They're whole wheat with all of the bread. bring you the thrilling adventures of Jack Armstrong, the all-American boy. Jack Armstrong is climbing up the dangerous mountain trail to the cave of the glacier. High above him, the towering peaks of the Andes press their eternal snows against the South American sky. And far below lies the valley with its hotel of winter sports. Jack and his friends are seeking Whisper whom the enemy agent Lozano has captured and brought to the cave of the glacier. Right now, Uncle Jim leads the way with Senor Quesada, the secret service man whom they rescued from the enemy agents, and Jack and Billy and Betty follow not far behind. Did I hear one of the kids mention our old friend, the Lone Ranger? He was there and held us just as captivated as television's version. The Lone Ranger! <laughs> with the speed of light, a cloud of dust, and a hearty high silver, the Lone Ranger. With his faithful Indian companion, Toto, the daring and resourceful masked rider of the plains led the fight for law and order in the early western United States. Nowhere in the pages of history can one find a greater champion of justice. Return with us now to those thrilling days of yesteryear. From out of the past come the thundering hoofbeats of the great horse, Silver. The Lone Ranger rides again. Come on, Silver. Let's go, big fella. Hey, Silver. Hey! And here's another old friend who entertained the younger set. And the pilot. Later, Pop Wheat Parties brings you Terry and the pilot. Do you remember I Love a Mystery, the Green Hornet? And, of course, there were many, many more. <laughs> Gentlemen of the jury. You are the judges of evidence that we lay before you. Be just and fear not, for the true administration of justice is the foundation of good government. Famous jury trials. Dramatizations of cases taken from actual court history. The names of persons and places have been altered to protect the identity of those concerned. The United States versus Captain Jacob Thorne. Early on the morning of March the 17th, 1919, the whaling ship Quantic sailed out of New Bedford, Massachusetts. Baghdad, Martinique, Singapore, at all the places of the world where danger and intrigue walk hand in hand, there you will find Steve Mitchell on another dangerous assignment. Mr. Keene, Tracer of Laws Persons, is based on the novel, Mr. Keene. And now, Gangbusters presents the case of the heartless harborer who lived by shielding the guilty until a boardwalk walker and a pair of dumbbells helped pierce his armor. Yeah. 
Gangbusters, the only national program to bring you authentic police case histories. Gangbusters, presented in cooperation with police and federal law enforcement departments throughout the United States. Gangbusters in America's crusade against crime. As a contrast to terror, we also had adventure. What evil lurks in the hearts of men? The shadow knows. <laughs> the shadow, Lamont Cranston, a man of wealth, a student of science, and a master of other people's minds, devotes his life to righting wrongs, protecting the innocent, and punishing the guilty. Cranston is known to the underworld as the Shadow. Never seen, only heard, his true identity is known only to his constant friend and aide, Margot Lane. Today's story, Death Stalks the Shadow. Mallory's in the end cell, Mr. Murdoch. Just talk to him through the bars. You're the last visitor he'll see. End cell, right. Hello, Mallory. Huh? It's me, kid. Peter Murdoch. Murdoch. Gee, I thought you'd never get here. Come on, pull yourself together, Mally. Uh, it's easy enough for you to talk. You ain't been sitting here waiting. Every day the chair getting closer. Now, Mally, you're testing the current. Listen, hear that big dynamo turnover? Coming! They're testing it for me! For me! Shut up! Murdoch, did you see the governor? Yeah, I saw him, yes. Well? Oh, say something! There won't be any reprieve, kid. We're licked. We're licked? That's funny, Murdoch. You ain't in here. You ain't gonna sit in that chair. I didn't kill anybody, Mally. Why, you dirty double-crossing rat. Who planned that killing? Who promised I'd never even do time for it? You did! Well, I didn't figure on the shadow, Mally. Yeah. Yeah, I know. The shadow. He caught me. He didn't know I was only doing your dirty work for you. I should have told yeah, him. Yeah, but you didn't. I trusted you. Peter Murdoch, the great lawyer. You said you'd get me off. I can't win all my cases. You didn't even try. Told me to the wolves. So the shadow wouldn't learn the truth about you. Well, it worked, didn't it? Yeah. If I could get through these bars, <laughs> I'd fix you, Murdoch. Anyhow, I can tell the truth about you. I'll sing so loud. Sing your head off. My reputation is too good. Nobody will believe you. The shadow might believe me, Murdoch. Suppose I told the shadow who turned Dan Malley from a decent kid into a killer. Stop dreaming, Malley. This is the death house. Tonight you're walking right through that door down there and you're not coming back. Why, you... Oh, you'd better forget all about the shadow. So long, Malley. Come back here! Come back here! So long, sucker. Molly. Molly, any news for you? Yeah, bad news. Gee, tough luck, kid. Yeah, but I ain't through yet. Before they burn me, there's something I gotta do. God! Hey, God! Where's that tin cup? What's the matter, Mally? I want to talk to Commissioner Weston. I got to see him right away. What for? He's got to locate somebody for me. Somebody I want to talk to. Well, don't stand there. Get me Commissioner Weston! <laughs> Cafe, well, Margot, this is a place Commissioner Weston showed me, and I, I had hopes the gaiety might stop my thinking. What's bothering you? Today is the 12th, Margot. Young Dan Malley goes to the chair tonight, thanks to the shadow. But, Lamont, surely you don't regret the shadow's having captured that murderer for the police? No, not exactly. Malley fired the shot, all right, but I've never felt the case was completely solved. I... Oh, well, let's forget that. Oh, Lamont, look, when that waiter started for the kitchen, the door opened without his touching it. Yes. Works by photoelectric ray. Oh, what's that? Look each side of the door, Margot. See those chromium fixtures sticking out of the floor? Lights hidden at the top of them? Yes. There's a beam of light between those two bulbs. When anyone approaches the door, his body breaks that ray. And whenever the ray is broken, the door opens without touching How it. How clever. Yes, and convenient. But, Margot, I've sometimes thought it might even prove dangerous to a certain friend of yours. Whom do you mean? The shadow. But I don't understand. The shadow can hide himself from the human eye, Margot. But he has a physical being. And the photoelectric beam could detect his presence. Hush, Lamont. 
Here comes Commissioner Weston now. Oh, I see. Well, good evening, Commissioner. Oh, Francis, how are you? And you, Miss Lane? Very well, Commissioner Weston. Won't you join us? Thanks, but I think not. I'm rather upset tonight. Well, what's the matter, Commissioner? Well, Miss Lane, have you ever heard of the shadow? The, the shadow? Oh, yeah. Yes, Margot. You've heard the absurd stories about his great deeds, huh? <laughs> All poppycock, of course. I'd give anything to contact the shadow right this minute. But why? A boy named Dan Malley goes to the electric chair tonight with vital information. The only person he'll talk to is the shadow. It's because I don't know how to find the shadow, I'm beaten. Well, I won't find him here. So if you'll forgive me, I'll run along. Good night. Good night, Commissioner Weston. Good night. Margo, my hunch about Danny's case must be right. Wait on. Yes, sir. Wait, here's money for my bill. I never mind the change. Thank you, sir. Come, I'll go quick. I'm going to the death house now. As the shadow. Why doesn't he come? Why doesn't he come? Were you waiting for me, Dan Malley? Who's that? Who spoke? The shadow. The shadow? There isn't much time, Malley. They're coming after you to take you to the chair. Speak quickly. What have you to say? Plenty. I can't save you, you know. You killed a man, Malley. Yeah, I know. But it wasn't my idea, Shadow. Honest, it wasn't. There was no evidence against anyone else. Yeah, don't I know it. He's too clever for that. Who is too clever? The bird that got me into this. The smart fellow that sold a dumb kid on crime being a good business. His name? Peter Murdoch. Do you know what you're saying, Dan? Murdoch's a famous criminal lawyer. His reputation... His reps are blind. Listen, Pete Murdoch's the biggest crook in this section. He's got a piece of everything. Well, right now he's planning a slum fire that'll kill thousands. And that I'm a million from insurance companies. If you're telling the truth... A man doesn't lie when he's only got a few minutes to live, Mr. Shadow. The job's going to be pulled late this week. I'll investigate it, then. If it's true, Peter Murdoch will pay for his crimes. But how can I get proof? That's easy. Now, listen. There's a friend of mine named Dopey Jake, down by the wharves, number 5 South Street. Jake knows enough about Murdoch's latest plan to prove what I said. I'll see him. Yeah, listen. If you can get to the filing cabinet in Murdoch's house, there's records and things enough to finish him. The shadow promises justice, Dan Malley. That's all I want. They're coming, Dan. Okay. I can take it. Thanks, Shadow. Thanks for coming. Well, Dan, it's time. Yeah. I know, Warden. Unlock the door, Gus. Night, Warden. Well, here goes. Take his arms, Gus. Very kid. I ain't scared. I ain't. Not as scared as Murdoch will be. Wait till the shadow gets him. All right, men. Forward. Shadow. There, yeah, don't be Jake. They'll fix him. Goodbye, Molly. Come on, kid. Keep your chin up. Come on, Molly. Then the other prisoners are saying goodbye. So long, boys. We'll be seeing you, Molly. Murdoch. Jake, the shadow. There was radio adventure, so vivid and so good that recently 160 radio stations around the nation have rerun the shadow using the original dramatizations for a whole new generation of Americans. Comedy and drama provided the warm family memories of those golden years, the dramatic punctuation that underscored our lives and helped to change the course of destiny came from the news bureaus of radio. To take you through those years in a kaleidoscopic living history, I've asked a friend of mine whose voice has been a welcome visitor into millions of American homes to take over. Frank Knight has been the voice of the Longines Symphonette for over three decades. And before that, his special vantage point as chief announcer for the Mutual Broadcasting System's flagship station, WOR in New York City, makes him uniquely qualified to recall with us the momentous and some not so momentous moments in history. Frank, it's nice to be with you again. Thank you, Jack. Listening to those great memories of radio brought back the names of so many of my friends that it's hard to know where to begin. Radio recognized its obligations very early. 
In 1920, station KDKA, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, broadcast presidential election returns for the very first time in history. It is now apparent that the Republican ticket of Harding and Coolidge is running well ahead of Carson Roosevelt. At the present time, Harding has selected more than 16 million votes against some 9 million for the Democrats. We'll give you the state vote in just a moment. But first, we'd like to ask you to let us know if this broadcast is reaching you. Please drop us a card, address station KDKA, Westinghouse, East Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. The first transcontinental radio network broadcast was of a Rose Bowl game in January of 1927. In the same year, Lindbergh's triumphant return from France was broadcast coast to coast from Washington, D.C. The President of the United States, Calvin Coolidge, introduced Lindy to Congress. As President of the United States, I bestow the distinguished flying cross upon Colonel Charles A. Lindbergh. All arrived in the Bourget Post. At every gathering, at every meeting I attended, were the same words. You have seen the affection of the people of France for the people of America demonstrated to you. Take back with you this message from France and Europe to the United States of America. Thank you. About this time, the newspapers were beginning to recognize radio as competitor for the advertising dollar. Do you remember the joke making the rounds? What is the difference between newspapers and radio? Well, you can wrap a herring in a newspaper. As the time for a new presidential election drew near, there were many very fundamental issues the stock market crash and the resulting depression, the question of prohibition and the evils that had brought on the scene. One of the greatest orators of his time, legendary in his pursuit of sin, fanatic in his determination that prohibition should remain the law of the land, was ex-baseball player Billy Sunday. The return to the saloon would mean the overthrow of civilization in our land. It was because I didn't want our boys to die drunkards that I fought and fight. I'm going to live long enough to see America so dry, you'd have to prime a man before he can spit. And I'll fight the saloon from Hawaii to Hoboken. And I'll kick it as long as I'm got a foot, and I'll fight it and punch it as long as I have a fist. I'll butt it as long as I have a head. I'll bite it as long as I have a tooth, and when I'm old and fistless and footless and toothless, I'll gum it till I go home to glory and hit goes home to perdition. The first United States president to take full advantage of the growing power of radio was Franklin D. Roosevelt. Starting with his own first inaugural address, FDR took to radio no less than 20 times in the first nine months of office. I, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, do solemnly swear that I will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States and will, to the best of my ability, preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States, so help me God. This is a day of national consecration. And I am certain that on this day my fellow Americans expect that on my induction into the presidency, I will address them with a candor and a decision which the present situation of our people impels. This is preeminently the time to speak the truth, the whole truth, frankly and boldly. Taxes have risen. Our ability to pay has fallen. Government of all kinds is faced by serious curtailment of income. The means of exchange are frozen in the current of trade. The withered leaves of industrial enterprise lie on every side. Farmers find no market for their produce and the savings of many years in thousands of families are gone. More important, a host of unemployed citizens face the grim problem of existence and an equally great number toil with little return. Only a foolish optimist can deny the dark realities of the moment. So first of all, let me assert my firm belief that the only thing we have to fear is Fear itself. 
Oh. As FDR turned his strength towards solving our domestic problems, the rumble of trouble began in Europe. New voices from afar became familiar to listeners in the United States as radio began to shrink the world. Against the background of disturbance in Europe, a thoughtful radio voice warned the United States to watch the East. In 1935, Edwin C. Hill, a crack NBC commentator, had this to say. Still another of those useless, troublemaking naval armament reduction conferences gets underway in London with prospects already darker than your cellar at midnight. Good old Uncle Sam, always hopeful, tells Great Britain and Japan that he would like to welcome a 20% naval cut. John Bull shuts up like the clam of commerce. With Hitler building up a navy for Germany and Mussolini on the warpath doesn't suit him at all. But Japan speaks out with an emphatic no. As an American, I admire the idealism and good faith of our government, but sometimes I do wish that our beloved Uncle Sam would stay at home and mind his own business. Someday, we may get our fingers burned. Mind our own business, speak softly, carry a big stick, and keep an eye on Japan as far as this side of the Pacific is concerned. Clyde Pangborn, famous flying man, testified before a congressional committee that in his opinion, America is threatened by only one enemy, and that enemy is Japan. He testifies that Japan has perfected man-operated aerial torpedoes in which the plane and the bomb are one, an instrument deadlier than any known weapon, certain to bring death to the operator. Yet thousands of Japanese, says Pangborn, have already volunteered for the honor of dying as pilots of these infernal weapons of infernal modern warfare. 1935 also saw a case closed written on the official records of the famed Lindbergh kidnapping case, three years after Lindy's infant son was kidnapped and killed. The National Broadcasting Company presents a special bulletin from the Press Radio News. Trenton, New Jersey. Bruno Richard Hauptmann was electrocuted at 8.47 tonight for the murder of the Lindbergh baby. This bulletin is from the Press Radio Bureau. This is the National Broadcasting Company. Nothing to fear, but fear itself, became the classic rallying cry of that recovery era. Radio carried that message of hope to homes throughout the nation. It has become a classic. Radio broadcasts of lasting impact became more frequent during the turbulent 30s as the world underwent change after change. One classic broadcast with an impact of intensely personal nature occurred when the dream of the dirigible crashed with the Hindenburg in Lakehurst, New Jersey. The description by Herb Morrison and his engineer Jimmy Nelson belongs in this collection because never again has a disaster been broadcast right from the spot from the first second when fate took a hand in what was to have been a routine news broadcast. We both flew down from Chicago yesterday afternoon aboard one of the giant new 21 passenger flagships of American Airlines. It took us only three hours, 55 minutes to fly nonstop from Chicago to New York. When we landed at Newark, we found another flagship of American Airlines waiting to take us to Lakehurst with our equipment when we were ready to go. And incidentally, American Airlines is the only airline in the United States which makes connections with the Hindenburg. The Hindenburg left Frankfurt, Germany, yes, uh, Tuesday evening, rather, at 7.30, their time. And for better than two and a half days, they've been speeding through the skies over miles and miles of water here to America. Now they're coming in to make a landing of the Zeppelin. I'm going to step out here and uh, cover it from the outside. So as I move out, we'll just stand by a second. Well, here it comes, ladies and gentlemen. We're out now outside of the hangar, and what a great sight it is. A thrilling one. That's a marvelous sight. It's coming down out of the sky, pointed directly towards us and toward the mooring mass. The mighty diesel motors just roared, the propellers sighting into the air and throwing it back into a gale-like whirlpool. No wonder this great floating palace can travel through the air at such a speed with these powerful motors behind it. Now, a field that we thought active when we first arrived has turned into a moving mass of cooperative action. The landing crews have rushed to their post, the posts and spots, and orders are being passed along, and last-minute preparations are being completed for the moment we have waited for so long. The ship is riding majestically toward us like some great feather, riding as though it was mighty, mighty proud of the place it's playing in the world's aviation. The sh ship is no doubt busting with activity, as we can see. Orders are shouted to the crew. The passengers are probably lining the windows, looking down at the field ahead of them, getting a glimpse of the mooring mass. It's practically standing still now. They've dropped ropes out of the nose of the ship, and uh, it's been taken a hold of down on the field by a number of men. It's starting to rain again. It's, the rain had... Uh, 
flashed up a little bit. The back motors of the ship are just holding it, uh, just enough to keep it from... It burst into flames. Get it, Charlie, get it, Charlie. It's right, and it's flashing. It's rising terrible. Oh, my, get out of the way, please. It's burning and bursting into flames, and, and it's falling on the morning fast, and all the folks agree that this is terrible. This is the one of the worst catastrophes in the world. Oh, it's, 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 the space is plenty. Oh, four or five hundred feet into the sky, and it, it's a terrific crash, ladies and gentlemen. The smoke and the flames now, and the flame is crashing to the ground, not quite to the mooring mass. Oh, the humanity and all the fans are just screaming around here. I don't do it. I can't even talk to people who are out there. It's a, it, it's a, oh. I, I can't talk, ladies and gentlemen. On this, it's just like that mass of smoking wreckage. And everybody can hardly breathe and talk and screaming, lady. I, I, I'm sorry. <laughs> Honestly, I, I can hardly breathe. I, I'm going to step inside while I cannot see it. <laughs> Darling, that's terrible. <laughs> I can't. I, listen, folks, I, I'm going to have to stop for a minute because I've lost the voice. This is the worst thing I've ever witnessed. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I'm back again. I've, I've, I've sort of recovered from the terrific explosion. And a terrific crash that occurred just as it was being pulled down to the mooring mast. The terrible amount of uh, hydrogen gas in it just caused the, the tail surface broke into flame first. Then there was a terrific explosion, and that followed by the burning of the nose and the crashing nose into the ground. And everybody tearing back at breakneck speed to get out from underneath it because it was over the people at the time it burst into flame. Now, whether it fell on the people who were witnessing it, we do not know. But as it exploded, they rushed back. And now it's smoking a terrific black smoke floating up into the sky. The flames are still leaping maybe 30, 40 feet from the ground, the entire 811 feet length of it. They're frantically calling for uh, ambulances and things. The wires are being hu uh, humming with the uh, activity. And uh, I I've, I've lost my breath several times during this exciting moment here. Uh, will you pardon me just a moment? I'm not going to stop talking. I'm just going to swallow several times until I can keep on. I should imagine that the nose is not uh, more than 500 feet or maybe 700 feet from the mooring mass. They have dropped two ropes, and uh, whether or not uh, some spark or something set it on fire, we don't know, or whether something pulled loose on the inside of the ship causing a spark and causing it to explode in the tail surface. But everything crashed to the ground, and there's not a possible chance of anybody being saved. I wish I could stop in just a moment and uh, see if I can get my breath again. And Charlie, if you'll fade it out just a minute, I'll come back with more description, ladies and gentlemen. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm back again. I, I raced down to the burning ship, and just as I walked up to the ship over, climbed over the picket line, I met a man coming out. A dazed, dazed, he couldn't find his way. I grabbed a hold of him. It's Philip Mangone, Philip Mangone, A-N-G-O-N-E, of New York. Philip Mangone, he's burned terribly in the hands. And he's burned terribly in the face, his eyebrows, and all his hair is burned off. But he's walking and talking plainly and distinctly. And he told me he jumped. He jumped with other passengers. Now, there's a Mr. Spay. It sounds like Spay. We're not sure of it. And uh, he also got out. Now, it is my sincere hope the majority of the passengers jumped when it came close to the ground, according to what Mr. Mangone told me. He said, thank God he jumped, and we say thank God for him also.